one, uh, you are in the STI care section um, talks today. We have three really great, wonderful speakers talking about three different perspectives of STI care. We're gonna have Dr. Kenneth Mayer speaking on rolling out telemedicine for STI care. We're gonna have Dr. Chad Hendry um, speaking about community-based STI Express Clinic. And we're gonna have Dr. Wiley Jenkins talking about STI care in rural areas. Um, the first speaker I'd like to introduce is Dr. Kenneth Mayer. He's an infectious disease uh, physician who's in the medical research. He's also a medical director of Fenway Health and co-director of the Fenway Institute. He's a professor of medicine, global health and population at Harvard. He's an attending physician at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And he's conducted uh, many biobehavioral studies of HIV and other STI prevention, including PrEP and antiretroviral treatment. So treatment is prevention. Um, and so he's going to speak to you today about his experience in Boston. So let me get the slide up for you. All right. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kissinger. And thank you, everybody. Um, good, good day. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what is essentially a work in progress. We've all been living under the shadow of the pandemic for the past uh, few months. Um, and the question is, are people sexually active in the in the middle of the pandemic? Uh, some of the early signs, not surprisingly, say yes. Uh, a, a national survey uh, um, using an online um, approach, uh, several uh, sex-seeking websites, um, uh, surveyed uh, men who have sex with men and found that uh, a substantial number decreased sex during the uh, intense uh, days of the pa early pandemic in March and April, uh, but uh, close to 10% did increase. And um, a lot of the factors we associate with increased risky behavior, such as uh, sex and substance use, uh, were certainly uh, present. Um, our own experience at Fenway Health, like many centers around uh, the country, uh, we made a major switch uh, um, very quickly to telemedicine. Uh, Boston area was hit quite uh, severely starting in late February, uh, most intensely in March and into April. You can see by April, the vast majority of clinic visits were uh, telemedicine visits. At the same time, uh, we noticed um, in our population of uh, individuals using PrEP, mainly men who have sex with men and some transgender uh, women, uh, about um, more than uh, 3,000 people with active uh, PrEP prescriptions at the onset of the pandemic. And we found um, a substantial number of PrEP lapses and a significant decrease in PrEP starts. And at the same time, we also found um, that SDI testing, not surprisingly, went down dramatically, but the test positivity rate um, slowly went up, uh, certainly suggesting that, um, some individuals who were symptomatic were still accessing services. But we have the picture um, and the acute response to the pandemic of decreased um, sexual risk behavior and SDI, but certainly that has been changing uh, more and more in recent months. And as you'll hear, uh, other reports in this session. Um, um, this is uh, the reality we're dealing with. So I was asked to sort of survey uh, the field uh, for this talk and um, contact a number of colleagues around the country uh, to see if their experiences are similar uh, to ours at Fenway Health, which is um, the largest sexual health uh, clinic in uh, New England, one of the largest in the country uh, for sexual and gender minority people. But just to get a sense if other people were ha experiencing similar um, uh, trends. Uh, so the take home uh, is that telemedicine SDI visits have become the norm, um, but it's not clear whether this um, is gonna be the new normal or not. Uh, and a lot of issues are at play, such as reimbursement. Certainly, for example, in Massachusetts, telemedicine was uh, highly restricted prior to the pandemic, uh, but it is um, becoming much more uh, normative. Uh, one big sticking point uh, in many centers is that uh, it's not true for telemedicine because somebody has to do the swabbing and the phlebotomy uh, very often for the um, SDI screening. So that, that still entails some um, direct patient contact in many situations. But as you'll hear in the situation of uh, Howard Brown, Express Clinics have been designed to minimize clinic time. Uh, the cost of the payment uh, varies greatly. Uh, so some public health clinics uh, can provide the test for free. Others still rely on insurance. Uh, and then uh, providers have become much more willing to call in prescriptions after receiving uh, lab results, not mandating face-to-face -face visits. Uh, but again, injections are really only 
feasible for the most part in clinics. Uh, and for PrEP monitoring uh, and other uh, screenings, uh, there's a willingness to uh, increase the time between screenings for um, high-risk sexual individuals in order to minimize a uh, clinic uh, visit time. In, in terms of um, um, the challenges for uh, remote specimen uh, collection, um, some patients uh, find the extragenital sampling uh, um, to be difficult, but I'll tell you about some experience we've had even prior to the pandemic with a research study I'm involved in to say that that's not necessarily the case with the appropriate uh, preparation. Um, another uh, theme that came up with multiple providers I um, talked to was that um, very often people who are at risk for SDIs have multiple other care needs, such as the need for social services to be attended to, behavioral health. So um, there may be a need for uh, more holistic approaches uh, that are not always optimally fulfilled for all patients uh, with um, telemedicine uh, in order to provide one-stop shopping. Uh, reimbursement challenges came came out loud and clear in many places, particularly places that have not expanded ACA or have uh, state programs at, at hand. And the coverage is piecemeal, so that it's not necessarily even the consistent package available for all patients. It may be at times insurance um, uh, determined. Uh, one colleague uh, reported uh, a noticeable trend of um, the delays in syphilis being associated with increased advanced presentations. Uh, so people, when they do come in with uh, syndromes um, that are diagnosed with syphilis are doing uh, much, much worse. So here's a model of what a telemedicine uh, program might look like. This is uh, from the Open Arms Clinic in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, uh, Phil Chen and Amy Nunn provided this information. So um, they have very good phone triage system. They do their intake. Uh, they streamline the encounter for telemedicine, and then they make the referrals, and they can um, uh, do the labs uh, on an ad hoc basis and uh, can call in uh, scripts to the pharmacy so that it limits the encounters but doesn't totally eliminate the encounters. So I mentioned that uh, we've had some experience with uh, telemedicine even prior to the pandemic. So with Aaron Siegler of Emory University and I, we've had a number of um, NIH grants to look at the idea of home self-delivered PrEP monitoring. Uh, so the package is called PrEP at Home. I put up the link, which is a Vimeo link uh, that we actually provide participants, which shows uh, an idealized participant uh, uh, showing how he self-swabs, how he does finger pricks, and uh, how he can um, um, collect enough blood uh, to be able to do uh, serology for uh, syphilis testing, uh, and to be able to also do a dried blood spot to monitor uh, tenofovir uh, to look at uh, uh, PrEP adherence, as well as uh, creatinine. Uh, so participants in this study uh, receive a uh, uh, Amazon box uh, kind of uh, uh, package on a quarterly basis. Uh, our initial study, which was a, a pilot project, an R34 project, uh, showed acceptability. We uh, reported this in the, uh, the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases, uh, and we uh, looked uh, uh, at uh, participants' um, feelings about using this system. And basically, you can see the green is uh, uh, positive um, uh, attitudes on the part of individuals who were uh, queried about this. And many of them felt that they would like to use this as a home uh, means of monitoring themselves for PrEP. Uh, so we're able, to, uh, in this um, means, uh, through this means, to be able to follow people on a quarterly basis and to obtain full SDI uh, screening. Uh, we now are in the middle of a larger study, an R01 study being conducted in Boston, Atlanta, um, Jackson, Mississippi, and St. Louis, and we'll compare this to standard PrEP care, but uh, this may be a harbinger of uh, the future. Uh, there are a number of different groups now, a number of different laboratories that are um, commercial labs that do public health testing, um, and do a variety of other different assays. Um, several of them uh, have very nice websites, uh, and again, it's going to vary by jurisdiction. Uh, what uh, you know, w which ones uh, are accessible to which patients? I just want to give you a background of the one that we use for the PrEP at Home study, which is Molecular Testing Laboratories in Vancouver, Washington. Um, their volume of tests has uh, uh, more than uh, doubled in addition to providing COVID-19 testing, um, all as mail-ins. Uh, they get specimens from virtually all U.S. states, though the largest three states that they receive specimens from are New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, 
I thought they were mainly only research uh, facility because that's uh, the kind of studies um, um, that I do, uh, that our team does with them. But really the majority of their work is um, um, commercial work with uh, close to 500 non-research providers. Um, and they do work with some of the sexual health apps uh, who also send work out to Quest and to LabCorp, but they see uh, this as a continually accelerating uh, process. So this is becoming more the norm. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, uh, who pays for this? Uh, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, another program that I think is worth um, commenting on is led by Charlotte Gatos at Hopkins. This is the I Want the Test uh, um, um, Kit. And asking her about her experience before and after um, COVID, they started ramping up because of the ending the HIV epidemic uh, funding in September 2019 on uh, getting linked to PrEP programs in Baltimore, being able to provide uh, a free home testing. Uh, initially with the pandemic, they closed down, but when they reopened, um, the, the city and um, uh, county uh, um, gave them additional work uh, in order to do more SDI testing. And so they've had a threefold increase in test uh, kit uh, requests. Uh, test positivity has increased as well. Uh, so this is just, again, another postcard from the edge of uh, uh, the future of this home uh, self-monitoring. Um, but there are challenges. So this is not uh, necessarily an easy way forward, uh, and it's not necessarily a panacea. First of all, there's the digital divide. Not everybody has a smartphone or a computer, um, and not everybody um, uh, does well navigating Zoom and apps. Um, internet connectivity can be limited. Uh, video conferencing, particularly around sexual health, may be limited if a client's not out. We think about all the homebound uh, college students, for example. This may not be uh, the optimal way to get um, sexual health services. Um, delivery of kits, again, may not be feasible because of privacy needs. Uh, some creative solutions, such as uh, Rupa Patel in St. Louis is uh, contracting with pharmacies to be able to allow people to pick up kits and with community-based organizations. And then again, not everybody reimburses for all these uh, issues. Uh, reimbursement is basically a can of worms. Uh, uh, I um, asked some of the different uh, home testing services, how much would um, um, screening mucosal sites uh, for GC and CT and uh, uh, serologic testing for syphilis run out of pocket? And certainly could um, be quite pricey for an individual paying out of paying out of um, uh, pocket. Um, the the tests um, um, uh, would have to be provider oriented, so um, ordered, so that would be a consideration. And there's no single payer. There's often different regulations for the different insurers. Uh, so Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, has 35 state coverage and tends to support remote specimen collection. Uh, but Medicaid, although it's national in theory, the states usually contract out and the services that are reimbursed are quite variable. So NASDAQ has been working um, on this and has a work group looking at these issues uh, around management. One exciting initiative of, of NASDAQ and the Building Healthy Online Community um, an initiative in uh, California working also with Emory has uh, been to uh, promote uh, free home um, HIV testing and now expand to SDI testing. So they uh, are working with local health departments that can use grants to purchase the kits and so uh, the cost of the individual uh, is either free or negligible. Uh, this is just an effort that's ramping up, but certainly uh, bears watching, uh, particularly for those who are most uh, in need of support for sexual health services. So this is a work in progress. Um, I think that telemedicine is likely to persist post-pandemic. Uh, um, certainly many providers indicate that they feel that the no-show rate is a lot uh, less when people are um, um, being seen on Zoom and not having to deal with city traffic. Uh, uh, some patients uh, also prefer um, a preference for this. Uh, so th that's another reason to consider uh, uh, moving this forward. Express clinics may minimize clinic time. And so uh, minimal services uh, provided on site and maximizing offsite uh, work. Uh, best practices are emerging, uh, but they're gonna need to be systematically evaluated. Uh, and again, it's still, Without a national health um, program, it's going to be um, uh, postcards from the edge, and, and different centers will evolve different practices. Uh, but eventually, with discussions like the one we're having today, we'll be able to iterate best practices. But we'll have to attend to the vi digital divide because one thing we don't want this to do is to exacerbate health disparities among those who might benefit the most from um, these services but have the least means to uh, support payment for them. 
So I just want to thank a number of the people that I queried and my own colleagues at Fenway Health, and thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayer. Wow. Um, taking advantage of a disrupting situation and really um, getting more health care to people. I was going to hold all questions and answers to the end, but I think this is a relatively simple one. Julia Zygman asks, can the dried blood spot for creatinine and adherence monitoring also be used for HIV and or syphilis testing? Yes, uh, I, I did mention syphilis, but I, I, you know, running through trying to keep on time. But yeah, definitely HIV testing is also used for the dried blood spots. So there are a number of things one can, can do with that. As long as you, the key is having a lab that's done the proficiency testing to be able to run the test from the dried blood spot. But it's a very flexible way of getting a lot of information. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayer. So we're going to move to our second, uh, and please write any questions that you have in the Q&A section and we will ask them at the end. So we're going to move to um, to Chicago, Dr. Chad, Chad Hedry, um, who has been with Howard Brown Health in Chicago for nine years and for the last four years of, of which he has been the Director of Sexual and Reproductive Health. He also currently serves as co-investigator for the CDC Network Epidemiology of Syphilis Transmission, or the NEST study um, at Howard Brown. He oversees a number of programs, including a prep program for over 4,000 persons. So um, it would be great to hear your particular experience, uh, Dr. Hendry. Thank you. Hello. Give me two. I have to put up your slides. Hold. Oh, are you getting them up? Yeah, so it looks like the slides are up. I just need to go back to the beginning. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Chad Hendry. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Director of Sexual Reproductive Health at Howard Brown. I'm um, excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about um, our Express Clinic model. Uh, this is just what I'm going to touch on. So Howard Brown, um, for those who don't know, exists to eliminate the disparities in healthcare experienced by lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgendered people through research, education, and the provision of services that promote health and wellness. So uh, with rising uh, rates of STIs uh, and related healthcare costs, a lot of clinics across the US um, were looking at ways to uh, increase screening and treatment, but uh, minimize the impact on staff and systems. Um, one of the ways in which we have done this was to implement STI Express services, um, which really refer to a triage-based testing without full clinical examination. Um, we have launched um, Express clinics in two locations, uh, one on the south side of Chicago located in Hyde Park, surrounded um, by Washington Park, Grand Boulevard, and South Shore, which all have rates of new HIV infections between 45.8 and 76.8 per 100,000, and uh, Oak Park, which is just west of West Garfield Park, Humboldt Park, and the Austin neighborhoods, um, which have rates of new HIV infections uh, between 34 to 45 per 100,000. We launched our Express Clinics in March of 2019. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here is some pictures from our Hyde Park site. Um, it was um, previously a shoe store, so it is a storefront location um, that was not really set up as a clinic uh, or hoping it doesn't look like a clinic. And the idea really is that it's sort of a nondescript space. Um, it has a community space, um, which you can see, uh, two dedicated interview rooms um, or small exam rooms, uh, two gender neutral restrooms, um, a micro lab where we do all the rapid diagnostic um, work and then a pneumatic tube which sends um, lab-based specimens that need to go out off-site upstairs to our actual one of our primary care clinics. And then we have two kiosks that um, are for paperless registration. So um, all the services that we offer in our express sites are free to the patients. Um, and we offer a wide variety of things including um, rapid and lab-based screening for HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, both urine and extra genital um, syphilis rapid, uh, rapid hep C, pregnancy screening, options counseling. We have a wide variety of receptive and inserted partner condoms and lubricants. Um, community members can also access free hygiene kits, healthy snacks, and then we have uh, weekly food services that come um, through the Fresh Moves program where people can come and uh, get access to low cost produce. In addition, we have, are utilizing the community space in evenings for programming such as lipology, um, which allows community members to come in and do uh, programs uh, in conjunction with uh, HIV and other screening services. So all of our 
Registration and result of delivery is a uh, paperless um, process that happens uh, through iPad kiosks that run uh, and utilize the HealthVana platform. We've been utilizing the HealthVana platform for a number of years in our walk-in clinics, um, but we weren't using it for registration. We now have transitioned um, with the Express clinics um, to a very uh, a paperless environment. So we created the Express uh, Outreach model with the intention to have the least amount of barriers possible. So with that in mind, we rolled this out differently than our current walk-in clinics, which are considered in scope. And, we, you know, we talk about insurance and income. Um, so all the screening services, like I mentioned, are free. We don't even ask about um, ability to pay insurance or income. Um, we don't bill or charge the patient for anything. So you're probably asking, how do we fund this? And so Howard Brown funds us through a number of grants and uh, 340B cost savings, as well as um, corporate funds that come from our resale shops. So, uh, wow, the screen's kind of hard to see, but um, we have, like I mentioned, we have a number of rapid on-site screening options, um, which we do on-site. We don't do chlamydia and gonorrhea on-site because we are not moderately complex. That is something we're looking at. Um, all of our, um, lab-based specimens go through Quest, and typically we have results back in one to two days. Uh, for rapid results, they'll show in the HealthVana platform within about 10 minutes from the time they leave um, the space. Oftentimes, uh, people will leave without even getting the rapid results, um, just if they're in a hurry, and then they get the results via the, the platform, and then uh, the laboratory-based results show up within uh, one to two days and will show automatically. So when we look at our patients, uh, where our patients um, are coming from, we can see that we've served patients from 145 different zip codes in and around um, Chicago and the expanded metropolitan area, as well as four different states. Um, we have a, a good number of people who are coming from the state of Indiana and Michigan, um, which is really great. We're super excited about that. So from the launch um, of the Express Clinic in April of 2019 through August 24th of 2020, we've seen a total of 967 patients um, access Express services. I do want to mention that since March of this year, our Express spaces have been closed. And so um, we're not have, we, we don't have people coming in the same ways. We are still doing Express visits um, through our primary clinic upstairs, primary care clinic upstairs, but we're not seeing as much volume. Uh, of the patients who came in through the time period, the majority of patients um, were male, 36.5% uh, of them were cisgendered female, and 3.1% of the patients um, are transgender. The average age range was between 29 to 34. Okay, so when we look at screening and positivity data, we can see that our overall positivity rate was uh, for HIV was about 1%. Um, it's a little bit lower than um, if our positivity rate across the board, um, but if you break it out by program, it's actually um, not too bad for Express. Uh, we see rectal chlamydia uh, at 12.6% for positivity and rectal gonorrhea at about 10.6%. Okay, so I'm going to transition now and talk about the evaluation project that we um, did. Uh, in April 2019, um, NATO engaged seven sites uh, and Cardia as an evaluation consultant in a multi-jurisdiction data collaborative. The goal really around this was to further establish an evidence base for express services as well as support um, quality improvement of established express models. Um, in addition, CDC conducted analysis of cost and cost effectiveness of, of the STI express services. So Howard Brown was one of seven sites that um, participated in the STI data collaborative. We are also the only community-based um, agency that participated, and it looked at a number of things, including patient uh, characteristics, testing and treatment, capacity and efficiency, patient satisfaction and cost. I want to mention before I dive into the few slides on the evaluation project, um, I could spend a whole hour talking about the evaluation project, but we just don't have the time. So um, for people who really want to dive into the outcome or the evaluation project, please check out the posters that we have, um, which is 2247 and 2248 to get a lot more information um, about that. Okay, so um, briefly I'll touch on the methods that we use. So using um, electronic medical record data, uh, Cardia accessed um, visit and patient level data across um, patients who received express and non-express services between July of 2019 to December 2019. In addition, um, we administered patient satisfaction surveys um, during the same time period to those receiving express or non-express services at Howard Brown. 
Um, the surveys were anonymous and um, paper-based and offered in both English and Spanish. So within the express time period, a large, uh, large proportion of express patients compared to non-express patients were younger, identified as unlisted racial group, Hispanic, female, straight, um, did not have any income or health insurance, and reported experiencing homelessness, um, extra genital exposure, high-risk substance use, and were also new to the clinic. So uh, testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea and HIV was higher overall. Um, However, the positivity for HIV was, was a little bit lower than what we see across the whole spectrum um, of clinics. Um, uh, uh, the sample sizes of patients who returned for treatment were small, making it difficult to assess um, differences in return for treatment and time to treatment between express and non-express. However, um, preliminary analysis doesn't really demonstrate a difference in these outcomes. So greater than uh, half of the express patients were new to the clinic, which is um, pretty exciting um, compared to approximately one fifth or 20% of non-express patients. So new patients were, were defined as patients that had not been to the clinic before July of 2019. So within the express time period, there were more non-express visits per day um, than express and the majority of patients who received express um, services were eligible for express. The way we determined eligibility was really uh, sort of the same triage um, methods that were shown a little bit earlier, but we you know, asked patients, are they symptomatic? Are they here for exposure? Do they wanna uh, start PrEP or need PEP? Um, any of those folks would get uh, taken up to the primary care clinic. Anyone who was screening only um, would then engage in the express services. The other main difference um, between express visits and non-express visits were time. Um, average express uh, appointments were about 40 minutes. Often um, some were significantly less than that. Uh, and the difference compared to walking in and going into the primary care clinic, that could take around two hours. So when we talk about patient satisfaction, um, patients in general who participated uh, in the satisfaction surveys reported high levels of satisfaction with all indicators of interest related to clinic services, staff, and environment. Um, few patients um, providing suggestions for improvement. Um, all respondents reported that they agree or strongly agree that they felt respected during their visit, that they had confidence in the staff that they met. Overall, you can see um, patient satisfaction was 100% for express patients. Uh, when asked to share the most important factor they considered when selecting a clinic, the top factors that patients reported were cost, um, being treated with respect, confidentiality, and location of the clinic. Um, other important factors were high quality care, cleanliness, convenient hours, wait time, and fast turnaround of results. When asked how patients refer or prefer to receive their test results, 51% of patients selected text message as their preferred method, um, followed by online patient portal, phone call, email, and then in person. And uh, as I mentioned with Health Fauna, um, patients do get a text message when their results um, are available to be viewed. So almost all or 98% of respondents indicated they were extremely likely to recommend testing at the clinic to a friend. Um, when asked how the clinic could improve its services, only three rep respondents provided suggestions. These were to extend hours, have a more convenient location and have health education classes or programs. Um, and for, per, for perspective around hours, we were offering it from noon until 6 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday. Okay, so when we talk about cost, um, during the evaluation project, um, cost was pretty significant uh, in terms of visit. The median estimated total cost per visit was around $402, and the estimated total cost per diagnosis was $8,389. The majority of this cost is tied towards um, building use um, and laboratory services. They were uh, around 57% of it was personnel cost, which most, for the most part was health educators. Um, things that we I want to make sure we consider um, is the slow program launch. When we launched this space, we had intended to have a number of programs, in, including a pharmacy in this space, um, because the ramp up of all those additional programs was extremely slow, and the ramp up in terms of patients coming in was slow. Um, all of that cost, overhead cost, went to this program. So if you were to evaluate it now, um, the cost would be significantly less per, uh, per visit and diagnosis. Okay, so there were a number of limitations. Um, a lot of that had to do with um, data assumptions around using uh, most recent paid, uh, most recent visit data, um, timestamp data accuracy in uh, electronic medical records, um, self-reported biases, uh, 
history and incomplete and or complex data when we're evaluating across all the sites. So one of the things I wanted to mention is uh, I mentioned since March, we've, we have not been running the Express Clinic in the storefront space and um, we have been providing COVID um, community care uh, screening services in that space, um, which is much needed and, and uh, pretty great, but that left a, a hole in folks accessing um, SDI Express services. And so we've done a number of things. So we launched an at-home prevention um, program, which started with um, delivering um, at-home HIV kits that launched in April. And we, um, April through around the beginning of August, we had mailed out um, around 400 of those. Um, Mid-August, we launched um, a collaboration with my lab box that includes HIV uh, and STI screening um, that gets mailed and they mail it back in and then results actually go into the Health on a platform. Um, so we're excited, super excited for that. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just thank a number of folks, um, Howard Brown, all the staff that made this possible, including Eric, Jay, Carol, um, especially Kristen Keglitz Baker, uh, and then NATO, CDC for supporting the evaluation project, and Cardia for helping with uh, all the information. So thank you so much. If you have questions, you can email me or we can ask here. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hedry. Um, so there are some questions. I'm gonna hold those off till the end, um, if that's okay. Uh, there, one question I am gonna address right now is people are, there was a question by Cheryl Mayo, how can I get access to the presenter slides? I just wanna remind you that this is being taped and it will be available and you can contact the, each one of the presenters and if they are willing to do that, they can provide you with the slides. So next on the list, um, moving from, uh, still is staying in Illinois, moving to Southern Illinois, Dr. Wiley Jenkins is Division Chief Epidemiolo uh, Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Southern Illinois University. Um, Dr. Jenkins' research broadly addresses health disparities, including cancer, sexually transmitted infections, and now focusing on rural communities, um, looking at opioids and some of the other uh, issues that are happening in that area. Um, he is, his work involves the intersection of rural service provision, drug use, and its associated stigma, as well as infectious diseases. So um, Dr. Jenkins, did you got it up? Thank you. Great. Yes, I do. And I'm quickly uh, going back to the beginning. So bear okay. with me for a moment. Thank you. Uh, there we go, all standing. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kissinger, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with people today. Uh, I have forewarning and apologies if I start to sneeze, my allergies are driving me mad today, uh, but I think I have it under control. So today I was asked to speak very briefly about STI care in rural areas. And this is based in part upon a clinical trial we have uh, running right now in Southern Illinois addressing infectious disease amongst people who use drugs and also just past research experience performing STI outreach and screening in rural areas. So this is more of an overview, but I'll be also throwing some uh, personal experiences and things in as well. So first off, the three topics. One is kind of explore the epidemiology and risk of bacterial sexually transmitted disease and infection in rural areas of the United States. Why do we care? Uh, two, kind of an overview of some of the venues performing and then the difficulties with doing such screening in rural areas. And finally, some possible strategies for how, you know, how can we do things better? How can we do things in a new way in some of these rural areas going forward? So the first one, the rural STI epidemiology and risk. Uh, and a lot of this may or may not be surprising to individuals depending on their experience, uh, but many rural areas have similar, if not increased, rates of substance abuse. And so if you look at the table there, we see that rural areas have increased rates, uh, pardon me, of things like uh, misuse of opioids, which has been highlighted uh, obviously in the past few years with the opioid epidemic. It's not ubiquitous, ubiquitous across all rural areas, but some rural areas are disproportionately impacted. The increase in methamphetamine use, I think would be no surprise uh, in rural areas over the years as well. And certainly there are equal rates of alcohol and other types of drug abuse. And obviously, you know, drug abuse being associated with risky sexual activities, we have then an environment for STI. Rates of transactional sex may also be high, especially amongst people who use drugs. And while the idea of commercial sex work may be uh, much less prevalent in rural areas, the idea of transactional sex may actually be quite high, especially amongst people who use drugs. And so, for example, in West Virginia, they found that over 18% of their client population uh, engaged in some type of transactional sex, you know, exchange of sex for food or drugs. Uh, and just from our own clinical trial so far, we found nearly 9% of our participants report that in the past six months. Uh, and then finally, homelessness. 
again, not something that many people typically think of in rural areas, especially amongst youth, is increasing faster in rural areas than it is in urban areas. And so we see there the chart on the bottom right, uh, student homelessness is going up 11% over the past few years compared to 3% nationwide. And also, of course, this is also much higher amongst people who use drugs. And just within our population, uh, upwards of 50% of experienced homelessness at some point in the past six months. And so this is a, a, a context of risk that may uh, increase the risk for STI. Epidemiologically, uh, there are some studies that indicate that rural areas actually do experience increased prevalence and incidence of STI. I would like to stress for almost everything we're talking about today that there is exceedingly little research about the epidemiology and contextual factors of STI in rural areas. And so while I quote from some studies, uh, there really just isn't that much known. Uh, so what we do know, though, and this is something we did as part of our work leading up to our work in Southern Illinois, is that uh, sexually transmitted infection in Delta region counties is actually much higher than in surrounding counties. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Delta Regional Authority, it is essentially similar to Appalachia, except it goes down the Mississippi River. And so this figure here, uh, you see those counties in blue are the 252 counties of the Delta Regional Authority going across eight states, uh, beginning at the southern tip of Illinois, and then reaching out to the east across the Alabama Rust Belt. And what we found with the initial studies is that if you look at those counties in the Delta region, compared to other counties in those states, that the rates of chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea are anywhere from 75 to 230% uh, higher. I mean, tremendous rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis in all those, both collectively and within the individual states. Another study in Pennsylvania found that chlamydia and gonorrhea is higher in rural communities. And then another study of the eight Americas, uh, looking at different types of population groups, found increased rates of those three STI amongst blacks in the middle and the rural south. And there are other risk groups as well. Further intriguing and a further kind of reason for why should we care about this is that geospatial core analysis indicates that there are that the sexual networks are not necessarily as concisely located in these rural areas as they may be in more urban areas. And so there's a larger degree of interconnectedness over spatial distances. And that even should we address fully perhaps STI in urban areas, if we neglect the rural areas, we leave an area open for continuing infection and reinfection. There are also different types of groups that are at risk and perhaps of larger proportion than many uh, may realize. For example, rural sexual minorities are out there and there are a fairly large number of individuals. So upwards of three to four percent of rural residents identify out as LGBT. And then again, many people have this view of rural America that may not include this type of risk group. Uh, rural sexual minorities may face greater risk. They may be more likely to find partners online, again, due to less people around, to uh, certainly the use of apps to find partners. Uh, rural infected males are at increased risk of syphilis, especially those younger, higher education, and of course, associated with uh, drug use is, is a risk factor as well. Rural sexual minorities are less likely to receive screening. Uh, so sexual minorities in Minnesota do see primary care providers, but are only frequently offered screening. Uh, and then rural uh, men who have sex with men are less likely to be screened, to receive condoms, and less uh, likely to receive kind of community acceptance of who they are compared to heterosexuals. This gets to the idea of stigma, leading to increased rates of risky sexual activities. Rural Americans and Alaskan Natives, uh, the majority of them live in rural areas. Uh, they face risk for STI infection. Uh, they may be more likely to begin sexual initiation at an earlier age. And they face delays in treatment, which may be related to distance or to uh, aspects of the Indian Health Service as well. Finally, rural uh, minorities, as far as uh, those of black race and uh, Hispanic ethnicity, those also are perhaps a greater proportion than people think of, upwards of 8% of black race uh, across rural areas generally. 9% or more of Hispanics and of course concentrations in some areas. And perceived discrimination becomes a big factor here uh, because uh, in these rural communities, uh, racial minorities may perceive more stigma, which then leads to perhaps more uh, risk taking, uh, which has been shown before. This is a picture for those unfamiliar with this environment. Uh, I pass this uh, frequently. It's a hardware store that has a pharmacy inside. And so this is maybe not something you see in more urban environments. So where do people go for treatment? And this may not be a surprise, but nationally, the majority of sexually transmitted infections are not diagnosed in STD clinics. They're diagnosed at uh, most likely in emergency departments as well as primary care. 
And we found in Illinois that this is true, not only for the state, but also for almost every level of reality that physicians, emergency departments are the greatest reporters of STI. Uh, however, screening rates are fairly low. And again, no surprise, even though chlamydia is a heatous measure, uh, rates are increasing, but are still kind of low. On the other hand, so yeah, physicians and hospitals are great, but they are diminishing in rural areas. And so rural areas have seen uh, a diminishment in the number of physicians practicing, whereas the number of physicians nationally has grown by 16,000. The purport number in rural areas decreased by 1,400 in that same time period. Uh, over the past 10 years, almost 7% of rural hospitals have closed. Another 25% were at financial risk. And this is before COVID hit and the financial constraints that they are now facing because of that. A study of rural health departments uh, found that they are near ubiquitous, of course, in the United States, and many people associate STI screening with rural health departments. And we also found that STD clinics are more and more concentrated the more rural one gets. And so the proportion of STI clinics located in health departments uh, ranges from a low of 52% in the most metropolitan counties, upwards to 90% in the most rural counties. So rural health departments, especially the more rural, play a larger role in providing STI care and treatment. However, there are problems with that. For example, in Pennsylvania, urban females are actually less or less likely to be screened in health departments than those in urban areas. Uh, rural health departments in Kansas are less likely to offer STI screening. Uh, in Yakima County, Washington, distance from a health department, distance from an urban area leads to delays or lack of treatment. And just honestly, in Illinois, from our own experience and maybe from others, many of these rural health departments only offer screening on either a half day or one day a week. And so that obviously is a limitation as well. Title 10 organizations are around. Uh, however, again, the screening that they offer is less optimal and the time and frequency of that screening diminishes with, with uh, diminishing uh, urbanicity as well. So the more rural areas have less hours, they have less times are open, less days. And there are many community-based organizations. However, these are frequently one-offs and there really isn't much known about them and they're frequently sustained with short-term funding. And so uh, unfortunately, they frequently come and go. So what do we do? Uh, STI is an important area and we can't really end the HIV epidemic if we don't also end it in rural areas. And part of that means having kind of a comprehensive set of STI care. And so really there's a couple ways we can approach this. One is let's make the existing better. Uh, so chlamydia is already a heatous measure. Uh, we can increase that. We can do, there are some evidence-based practices to increase uh, screening in current medical venues. And while this is worthwhile to pursue, ultimately we do not really believe that it's feasible to create new medical venues, especially in these rural areas. It just is not really cost feasible to do so. So we kind of increase what we have, but then we need to seek for other things as well. Local health departments, also ubiquitous. They could also be uh, increased or augmented as far as SCI screening is concerned. And there have been many reports that they really need a lot of training. They need training with, uh, with data collection, with providing better services, but also with billing. And this is something that's problematic because there's this wide uh, spread feeling that STI uh, screening should be free. And so the idea of implementing any type of billing, especially to the patients, is really hard to accommodate with this environment. Uh, but the idea of billing for third parties is something that can be done. Uh, but still, even still in these rural areas, just giving more money and augmenting a health department may not be the best route because they're not always the best or trusted source. And something to really think about these rural communities is that often everybody really does know everybody. And so whether it's a health department or whether it's a private physician practice, that may be the single site for an entire county for healthcare. And the person that you go to see may actually be the physician who delivered you. And so this becomes problematic when someone becomes an adolescent or young adult, maybe they uh, have a change of sexual orientation or want to don't feel comfortable discussing sexual orientation with someone who used to be their pediatrician, or they don't want to go to the health department where their English teacher's wife works. There are a number of reasons why there's a loss of anonymity as a real barrier to approaching some of these standard venues. We need to think of something different. So we need to think of different ways. There are things like mobile clinics, there are things like community-based organizations, there are things about the internet, these have all been discussed before, and I'll briefly touch on two that we have tried with some of the ins and outs. Our partner in Southern Illinois is someplace called the Community Action Place. They are a mobile clinic that also has a couple hard and fast sites. 
And what is really uh, perhaps innovative about this group is that they are truly mobile. They are a full syringe service provider. They service upwards of 16 counties through their sites. They are very, very busy. Uh, they offer screenings for hepatitis, HCV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. Uh, their positivity rate is approximately 18% for STI, so it's fairly high. And here's the neat thing about this as a community-based organization, they have sustainable funding. So they started with donations, they uh, evolved into acquiring health department contracts, both block grants and fee-for-service as a harm reduction partner and to do screening for different things. And now they've moved also to accommodating research, uh, such as what they do for us and other organizations. And so here's a model that is built to provide uh, resources and services to sexual minorities and those who use drugs that has been able to acquire sustainable funding uh, on its own. Another one, we've talked about this before briefly, the idea of the internet-based testing. This obviously is scalable, it's uh, cost-effective. Problematic though is loss of patient engagement. People may test positive. There's also the loss of kits uh, with a return rate that can be fairly low. And the chart I show there on the right is the idea that honestly, advertising and putting this in people's face is critically important. And so the weeks that the advertising was on where the little dotted line goes up, we see an increase in test results. And when the, the radio advertisement stopped, bam, it went to zero. So getting this in people's faces and getting them to engage with the website and to return the kids is problematic. So cost-wise, very low. Engagement-wise, uh, much more difficult uh, nut to crack. Uh, and there are a bunch of community-based organizations. There are a bunch of community-based types of activities that can be targeted to specific things. And there are several resources that have been developed to address those uh, as well. And I give a couple of citations for those. And so ultimately, really the takeaways, I, I hope people to come away from this, is that there's substantially more diversity within rural communities than may be surmised. Rural is not a homogeneous construct across the entire United States. There are different risk environments, different groups. Uh, overall, the risk of STI may in some ways be greater than some other urban areas and not just among some special groups uh, such as them. Uh, many rural areas have fewer resources in total um, or may have some resources, but they don't screen as frequently. And ultimately, we need to develop strategies uh, that do not rely upon high volume, high rates of participation to be feasible. You know, we've got to be able to do more with less. We've got to be scalable. And there are ways to do this, but ultimately there's a paucity of research on almost every aspect of this. So the rest of this is really all of my citations and I would welcome any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So um, excellent talk on a really underserved population in the rural area. So I'd like to invite all those speakers to come back if you would be so kind. Um, I think I can put us on camera. And so um, there are several questions that are um, I'm gonna ask. So the first one is actually, uh, for Dr. Mayer, um, uh, oh, well, 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 no, not for Dr. Mayer, sorry for Dr. Henry. Um, at the Express Clinic, what is your sustainability plan moving forward without revenue generation? Great, that's a, that's a spectacular question. <clears throat> so we, because with the, a large number of folks who come in that get screened out of Express Clinic and actually uh, get shifted upstairs to um, prep or other primary care medical services, um, currently, the way we're, we're sustainable is utilizing 340B revenue or cost savings that are directly related to PrEP. Now, we all know that's going generic and that has some pretty big implications. And so I think we're looking at ways um, to diversify that revenue. Um, but, you know, and, and that may even include accepting insurance in the future. I think we don't know that yet. Um, with COVID coming sort of out of nowhere for us, um, a lot of stuff is sort of on hold, so we're evaluating that. And, and as soon as I know more, I'd be happy to share with folks. But I think, you know, we're, we're not super sure of that answer yet. Great, thank you, Terry uh, Anderson, for that question. So John Nelson asks, and I think this is also for Dr. Henry, are STI symptom symptomat uh, are STI symptomatic discharge lesion rash patients that come to the Express Clinic taken to the non-Express Clinic for treatment prior to lab results, or how does that work? Yeah, so anyone who comes in either, uh, you know, disclosing exposure symptoms, um, they're taken upstairs and presumptively treated before the results come back. Okay, great, thank you so much. So um, Tom, Tom Bertrand asks of Dr. Mayer, what do you think is the impact of telemedicine and express, well, maybe it's for everyone, telemedicine and express clinics on the ability to conduct good partner services with patients who test positive for HIV, syphilis, and other STIs? Uh, 
as as usual, Tom asks an excellent question, and I think I think we don't have data yet, um, you know. But Tom, Tom and other uh, state um, uh, program directors will be in a good position to to evaluate that. I certainly think that you know telemedicine is a tool, and I, I think that we should prepare for its increased utilization. And we also think the pandemic's not going away tomorrow. So I think uh, trying to think about how we institute best practices. Um, around telemedicine and partner notification will, will be really important. And for us with Express, um, uh, most of our staff are cross-trained with partner services. We're one of the only community-based organizations in the country that have an, our own partner service team um, that's equal to the local health department in terms of size and volume. So um, we are providing um, partner services in Express spaces in terms of telehealth. Um, we are seeing a huge drop off uh, in the ability to deliver partner services as well as, and this is anecdotally, I don't have the data in front of me, but even because we, a lot of our sort of non-essential staff are working remotely, a lot of interviews are occurring through phone and other ways of, of follow up. And so the drop off is somewhat significant and I'm sure there'll be a lot of data coming out about that in the future. Great. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Jenkins, here's a question from, uh, Dr. Gatos, Charlotte Gatos, who's the um, originator of I Want the Kit. Uh, she says, great work, Wiley. Uh, to what do you mainly attribute the higher rates of STIs in some rural areas? And there's a couple of questions, parts of this question. So why, why, what do you attribute? You know, I honestly, I would not attribute it to really any one thing. I think it's a combination of many smaller factors. Uh, so for example, in rural areas, Honestly, for adolescents, there are very few extracurricular activities. And so there are some indications that they initiate sex at an earlier age, may be less likely to use condoms. So that's a small increase. Uh, for uh, sexual minorities uh, in rural areas, there are far less and far fewer venues to gather and, and to be open and to be out. And so what we find is that many sexual minorities travel distances uh, from Southern Illinois to go to Cape Girardeau, to go to St. Louis, to go to Paducah. And the idea there is that if they're going to make this a weekend getaway, um, then they may engage in more risky activities because this is a more rare occurrence. Uh, we also have a large number of our individuals who use drugs uh, who are homeless and not necessarily homeless in the sense that they you know, live under an over overpass or kind of a big city type of homeless, but they do a lot of couch surfing. And so that leads to increased rates of transactional sex, we also have increased rates of stimulant use, such as methamphetamine, which obviously is associated also with risky sexual activities. And so I think when you start bundling all of these things together, even though individually they may be somewhat small increases, cumulatively it leads to an increased risk that we see in these areas. Great. And also, Dr. Jenkins, you know Dr. Davis is going to ask this question. Are rural areas well suited for home collection of STI specimens with mailing and e-prescriptions? And I've worked with Dr. Gates in the past on, on a project years ago, and absolutely, you know, something like I want the kit, uh, a home collection is feasible, it's relatively cost effective, uh, it's acceptable to clients. Uh, the problem, again, is really kind of engaging with the clients to do it uh, and to getting the kits to be returned uh, and then to engage with people who do test positive, because, again, if they test positive and there is a single physician practice in that county, that's a barrier. Now, as far as e-prescribing, that I'm not aware of how well that works in this area. And that would get around the idea that people have to actually present uh, to a physician maybe they know, uh, but I'm not sure how it works. But the idea of a scalable internet-based types of thing in theory would work quite well. Great, and so you're still in the hot seat, Dr. Jenkins. Beth Sheba Johnson asked, although physicians uh, decreased in, in the rural areas, are there nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in the rural areas that are taking, absorbing some of that? Anecdotally, I know that yes. And, and I know just from our own Department of Family Medicine, we have a significantly increased in number of NPs and PAs. I do not know to what extent uh, they are equaling the loss of physicians. Uh, I just don't have that data. And still, that really doesn't get around the idea that many rural counties may have a single clinical practice. Uh, and so even if now they have four nurse practitioners and eight physician's assistants, it's still that one place where everybody knows your family and you still fear that loss of anonymity. So, so there is a little bit of leeway, especially for this type of low level care. Uh, but honestly, the anonymity and feared stigma is also will remain a big barrier, I believe. So this is a situation where you don't want to go to a place where everybody knows your name, I guess. 
Um, there's exactly, a and everybody knows your family. <laughs> right. There's a question from John Creviston, um, and this is how does Howard Brown Brown? This is a doc, uh, question for you, Dr. Head Pendry. Uh, how does Howard Brown Brown advertise their Express Clinic? Great question. Um, so Howard Brown does not. Um, really advertise our express clinics. It's typically been word of mouth. The only time we did any advertising um, was a small campaign, which was uh, funded through the Illinois Department of Public Health that focused on um, the Oak Park location. But our 55th Street location is completely word of mouth. And when you ask, most people have heard from their friends. The only other place you might find it is on our website. Great, thank you so much. This is a question from Bianca Prentice. She wonders, I work in West Virginia as a disease interventionist, and I find that I have trouble getting follow-up with patients who are inadequately tested by physicians. Is there any data on testing adequacy in rural areas, and what is the environment surrounding testing education, both healthcare-wise and for patients? So that would be for you, Dr. Jenkins. Do you need me to restate it? I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, physicians typically have training in STI and screening, obviously in medical school and residency. How well they practice and employ that in their practice, I do not really know. Uh, I, I believe that many state health departments offer training, uh, certainly in disease intervention uh, training. Uh, I don't know that I can really answer um, how training, at, uh, the adequacy of testing by different physicians and clinicians. Uh, this may be an opportunity for outreach by, say, a state health department to provide uh, kind of a training or guidelines for physician practices, but that's really beyond my experience, unfortunately. Thank you so much. So, um, Bill, I'm going to get Bill um, Pearson, I'm going to get to your question in just a second, but I want to pose this question to Dr. Mayer because I think it's a really important one now. How, are, how is STI, STI care going to change in the face of COVID? pandemic and are we disrupted forever or what do you envision? Uh, I don't think we're gonna go back to the pre-COVID era. I think though there'll, there'll be lessons learned from um, the provision of uh, these telemedicine services and the accommodations we've had to make uh, to provide optimal um, sex, sexual health services for people during this period. But you know, a lot um, has to do with what we're all obsessively paying attention to which is November 3rd, I think if, uh, you know, we, we have a very fragmented healthcare system at the present time and there's no um, uh, attempt uh, currently to ameliorate some of the structural um, problems. I think uh, with a fresh pair of um, eyes, I think, you know, I can say this as an individual, um, you know, I, with a fresh pair of eyes, I think there are opportunities for more s systemic change that I think will be better uh, for everyone on many levels. But I certainly think SDI care would be part, part of the mix there as we have a more coherent system. So did I hear you say, Dr. Mayor, go vote? Is that what I heard you say? Early and, early and often. Early and often, and maybe not so often. Um, um, this is, Pearson, I'm getting back to your question for Dr. Jenkins. How do we get policymakers more interested in investing in the health infrastructure in rural areas? Oh man, that's a million dollar question. Uh, and, and I think almost any condition that deals with rural areas asks the same, you know, how do we get people interested? Because honestly, they just don't have the numbers. You know, our service area for our clinical trial in Southern Illinois covers over 6,000 square miles, 16 counties, but it has only 330,000 residents. Um, as a voting, as an economic block, it just isn't that impressive. So m m what I try to do personally, and what I would suggest, is we need to make the health care of rural areas important to metropolitan areas. And so really couching the idea that STI control in rural areas will help STI control metropolitan areas, that controlling HIV, screening for HIV in rural areas will assist the national ending the HIV epidemic. That I think might be the biggest hook and, and the idea that these are connected, that you can't just solve Chicago or Boston or Philadelphia that you need to surround the places that connect to them as well. Uh, but I think, you know, trying to do it as an independent entity that they should care for rural just because it's rural. Um, people haven't succeeded with that yet. So I think we need to make it relevant to the rest of the country as well, that we truly are in this together. 
Great, that's a huge debate. So thank you so much. And Nicole Dukers Muri, I'm not saying your name right. Anyway, really great session, she says. I look forward to hearing more on best practices and to share lessons learned. So I wanna echo what um, uh, that sentiment and just thank you so much for three really excellent presentations. They were very thought provoking and from three di really different perspectives on how to deliver STI care. So um, uh, there is a question, are there any handouts available? Are there handouts available? I think you can probably contact each individual um, speaker and they may be able to provide you with those handouts should you should you require them. But anyway, I just wanna um, thank you so much for every for this really great um, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.